Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could uh, explore uh, the uh, uh, connection between responsible cooperative citizenship and the uh, modern political structure, the more traditional political structure. I think yeah. you said at one point that if they're cooperating, then all well and good and you can make uh, progress. But I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if we looked at the four, the four world the global issues, and and you think of the uh, ability of the, I think of what Martin Laughlin and people hang on to, the idea that, that the state has this parent power too, that, that, that can really accomplish a change in ways that uh, that the cooperative movement can obviously contribute. I mean, you've you've brought it to life in, in such a a great way, but but um, you know, is there a cooperation that's imagined in, in this, or is it really uh, so much can be accomplished by cooperative citizenship? Which is almost a, a passing away of the uh, of the uh, of the more traditional state, which I don't think you are saying. No, I just wondered if you could explore that. I'm not. Thank you so much for that question because that allows me now to go on longer. <laughs> <laughs> I th I think that is the great question today, not just in Canada, but really globally. How do we bring these two traditions of citizenship together? The people who are working within the institutions of modern representative participation, the form it from within, the liberal democrats, the multiculturalists, the multi-religion, people who are trying to gain recognition for diversity and so on from inside these institutions or trying to get social and economic rights spread around the world and so on. And then our cooperative citizens who say, well, that's a waste of time because these representative, the this very small sphere of democratic participation is surrounded by these institutions and processes that are protected by tier one rights. And so you'll keep trying, but it'll be very limited. So everybody under 35 doesn't vote anymore. They say, I'm going to, I'm going to be a good citizen, but I'm going to be a good cooperative citizenship citizen. So the great tragedy of Canada is the reforming modernists and the cooperatives barely talk to each other. You bring them together at a workshop, and the modern citizens, when they're trying to think of some kind of institutional change, they want a new mode of recognition in the public sphere, they hardly ever consult the cooperatives. The cooperatives, when they get going on local self-reliance and so on, <coughs> almost never talk to their political representatives. <coughs> and it's, it's a real tragedy. It's the division of the progressive forces in the 20th century into these two features, and we see it over and over again in, in uh, turnout of elections and so on. And it's very, the problem is not to see these two traditions as opposed to each other and mutually exclusive, but how can we combine together the best features of both? And it, it's really very hard to do, and it's, it's very hard to get cooperative citizens who are often organizing co-ops and global networks to get interested in party politics. On the other hand, people who are interested in party politics and reform from within don't really think of these cooperative citizens as engaged in citizenship. That's the point I'm trying to make. They're serving the public good, which you want to do too, and they're doing it in a very distinctive way. And the thing to do is how do we bring them together? I, I'm lucky enough to live in Victoria. My um, MP is Denise Savoy. It's about the only person in Canada I know who lives in both these worlds. She's a representative from Victoria in the federal parliament. When she goes home to Victoria, she's an active agent in every cooperative movement, in the 100 mile diet, uh, everything imaginable. But most of us don't have that much time. But I think we need to find ways to bring the best of these two traditions together. And it, it's really a, a, quite a deep problem, because if you speak to people in Europe who are interested in democratic reform, say uh, religious pluralism in the public sphere, you say, well, there are all these co-ops that are dealing with immigrants, uh, Muslim immigrants in Europe, and they're inventing all these creative ways of integrating them into local communities and getting local Christian communities to be friends with them and interact with them non-violently, what Paul Gilroy calls conviviality from the bottom up, right? But 
the high-flying theorists of reform politics don't even talk to them. And on the other hand, everybody that writes about these cooperative citizens is kind of given up on the representative institution. So we can. So that's why I'm so interested in how how can we get academic research on these global problems in relations of mutual education between cooperative movements and reform representative institutions, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yes? I have a question about, uh, you know, at the end of your, your talk, you talked about how religion is sort of um, this engager in politics and stuff. And one thing that I found really difficult to understand in terms of, of, of civic engagement was uh, when we look at uh, American uh, culture wars, and how really it's just like a, it's always it's always a volley of, of, of non uh, cooperation, non engage uh, non engagement really in a dialogue. So I was wondering, what's your thoughts on that kind of? Because it seems in Canada as well, it's like it's a it's this sort of this culture war is spreading in, in, all around. So. Yes, I here I'll make a very crude distinction, and I realize I'm in a room with people who know these distinctions much better than I do. But what I the religious or the aspect of religious traditions that I was talking about were people who see in their religious beliefs that the ground of our being is relations of love, God's love. Uh, and so relationships of, in acting, relationships of love or nonviolence, mutual cooperation, were manifesting <coughs> God's presence in the world. Now a lot of the, um, the Christian right is not that view of what Christianity is all about. It's a very different view, a very different interpretation of the New Testament and the Gospels than this one. So this paper really has nothing to say about the Christian right. But it does point out, and this one thing that fascinated me in all my research, if you look at the origins of these cooperative movements I've been listening to almost all have <coughs> religious origins. And the religion is driven by, I mean, it starts with the Quakers in Europe in the 17th century, Mennonites, Hutterites, <coughs> nonviolence, love. It's not about power, it's not about justice and retribution and so on. Justice is giving them relations of mutual love and building them from the ground up. I was giving the uh, Oxford Amnesty International Lecture this year on this topic, and they put me up at uh, uh, Ruskin College. So here's Ruskin is one of the great uh, cooperativists of the early 20th century, late 19th century, also uh, peace and nonviolence, anti deeply religious person. And so when I talk about the religious sources of this cooperative citizenship, I'm thinking of uh, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, indigenous people, who see that their spiritual traditions are at this view, just to put it very crudely, that the ground of our being is relationships and mutual love. Whereas the, the, the Christian right discussion is a very different structure of argument. And I don't have much, I, that I don't study the Christian right that much, I'm sure I should. <laughs> the loudest voice is well, but are they? I mean, they're the loudest, but if you look at all the Quaker schools, you look at 20% uh, of Americans still investing in, in cooperative savings. They, they, they miss the whole financial crisis. The co-op survived untouched. I guess everybody knows this. You, you earned a healthy 11% if you had kept your uh, money in, in cooperative savings and loans. And so there's a whole counter tradition, sort of, um, it's a wonderful life. Uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart, same for loans people, which we carry on. We don't have a loud voice in uh, American life, but they carry on these community organizations in quite astonishingly resilient way. Um, uh, first off, thanks as usual for, uh, I always find the careful distinctions that you make help me think of place, so I appreciate that. Uh, I also very much appreciate the kind of insistence on looking at the, at the ethical or the spiritual dimensions of uh, some of these questions. And I think that, you know, the norms of reciprocity among people when you get into deliberative moments are really quite stunning. And, uh, you know, I've also seen this working in the 
occasions when people who look like they would never be able to dialogue actually are able to dialogue uh, together. So um, on, the, on the question of the religious right, ironically, uh, it's one of the new interesting fractures in the US that uh, a sizable minority of uh, churches and groups that are engaged or that would have been defined as the religious right are actually splitting off precisely because of the environment question, because they're exploring some of these things. So I think there's a lot of interesting complexity uh, uh, to, uh, to examine there. Uh, what's my question? Well, uh, I want to assure you that the That's question... Like stop there. If you're <laughs> 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 I'm appreciative inquiry there. Um, uh, uh, first off, I'm not asking the realist question that assumes that the Hobbesian, Hobbesian tale of what human nature is is, is appropriate. I don't think that's uh, uh, true. But there's a reason why I'm a political theorist as opposed to a philosophical ethicist. And part of that is because uh, regardless of what I take human nature to be, um, uh, I'm fairly cognizant of structural pressures and interests on, on major portions of the population, which uh, push us in various ways to act and to justify in various ways. Um, and so uh, here's my question, I guess, uh, and I'm not saying that you need to do this. My own ethos is more bicameral, uh, in a sense. And I think it's very important to have a deliberative invitation on ethos. But I think there's also a value <coughs> being able to engage in polemics from time to time. And in, to use some of the examples that, that, that you gave, I mean, Martin Luther King looks much more attractive as a debating, as a deliberation partner to many Americans in the 1960s if you have Martin, uh, if you have Malcolm X as the other alternative. So I guess what I'm just in, interested to hear what you have to say about the kind of relationship between deliberation and, and, and polemics in a certain sense in terms of ways that allow and engage uh, uh, discussion, uh, and not that realist question of, well, how do you force people to disagree? Because I agree that's, that's not a question of interest in asking. So well, I guess there's an easy answer and a, and a, and a much longer, probably, non-answer, longer conversation. But I, I <clears throat> the easy answer is I meant by when I said, and when citizens call an unjust relationship into question and enter into negotiations, then that's the space of public reason. I didn't mean to define public reason narrowly. I meant to include uh, arguing and bargaining. Uh, you, you call it polemics. Uh, also, I included within it what I call these networks of negotiation, which are they're non-violent, but they put pressure on Nike and so on to force them to the table by uh, boycotting their products around the world or, or on the West Coast to boycott uh, forced products that aren't harvested in, in an environmentally sound way. Now, those <coughs> tactics, on some people's view, are coming close to being violence, violence against shareholders, maybe, or something like that. But I, I, have a, I think we have to have a kind of very broad view of what counts as nonviolent negotiation practices, much like Gandhi did, <coughs> assault marches. For Gandhi, the key nonviolent tactic is non cooperation. Any unjust re regime uh, sustains itself on the cooperation of those who are subject to it. The minute we withdraw our capacities and non cooperate, it can't operate. The soldiers refuse to kill Viet Cong, the war ends. And so that, for Gandhi, that's non-cooperation uh, is really the key mode of negotiation because it brings the regime to a halt. And forms of non-cooperation could be con considered to be violent <coughs> on some accounts. But my, I would argue that all those kinds of tactics fall within the realm of non-violence. And then the second question, the longer question is, what does the realist say in reply? I think they are more effective. They are actually more effective than armed violence. I think King will outlast Malcolm X. So I realize in reality, people got frustrated with King's techniques of nonviolence and of love and his wonderful speeches and so on. And they turned to Malcolm X and they returned to violence and Black Panthers came on the scene and it looked very attractive this violence. And the literature in the 60s is really very interesting. There was a 